pastors here, one of members at Bethany Baptist Church. Welcome to our class number 11 of Christians in the Workplace. This is the second to last class. Next week will be the last, and the following week we'll have panel discussion. So we just have two weeks left. In terms of class, we'll have the next class as the last. So this is the second to last in terms of class sections for the Christians in the Workplace. Today we're talking about something very simple called evangelism. Did you guys get to read the, the email that I sent? No, no, no. I sent it pretty late, so that's okay. But I sent an email out because we typically don't, I mean, in the evangelical circle, evangelism is the typical word that we, that we use. But at our church, which is very quirky, we don't use that word majority of times. We use the word Yes, gospelize. Do you guys know the reason why we use the word gospelize? Take a wild guess, if you can guess anything. Um, I think as evangelism is usually used with the connotation of sharing the gospel with non-believers, gospelize is like more broad towards like believers. Yeah, that's right. I think that's hitting the, the point. <laughs> So the reason why we use, or PJ has coined the term gospel eyes, because our church is very quirky, is because um, when we, just like what Grace says, when we think about the word evangelism, immediately our minds jump to non-Christians. Wait, hold on. Before we begin, let me uh, open us up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we get to think about e evangelism, gospelizing at work. We pray that you would help us to be bold, help us to ask private and public questions, and to be winsome in our speech. Help us to know that you've placed us at our work, not only to worship you through and in our work, but also to uh, befriend and deepen friendship with those who are not Christians to gospelize them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. There should be handouts, Grace. Thanks for passing them out. Again, my name is Peter, one of the pastors, one of the members here at Bethany Baptist Church. Welcome. Our bathrooms are located on your right. Uh, feel free to use any of these two doors, and you can walk to your right, either upstairs or downstairs, to find restrooms. Feel free to excuse yourself whenever you like. Now, today's topic is class number 11, evangelism, but I am trying to refrain from using the word evangelism. So, if you have your worksheets, um, I printed them out before I looked at them, and I forgot to change them. So, if you can cross, cross out every time you, were, you see the word evangelism, and use the word gospelize. Now, we're, tr we're not trying to say evangelize is a bad word. We don't think so. Euangelion is a word that comes out in the Bible saying, which means, or is translated as gospel, or preach, or teach. But the word that we typically use here because we're a quirky church is because is the word gospelize. And the reason is because, like what Grace said, when we think about the word evangelism, we're thinking um, only evangelize those who are not Christians. But when that word is used, it's actually used to preach and to teach both Christians and non-Christians. That's why PJ coined the term gospelize, which we do for both Christians and non-Christians. So we do want to switch the word there. So class number 11 is gospelizing unbelievers, sharing Christ with your colleagues. Now, let me start with a few questions. Just a quick show of hands. Raise your hand if you've ever shared the gospel with someone from your workplace. Great. Put your hand down. Thank you for sharing. Raise your hand if you've ever had the opportunity to share the gospel with someone from work and didn't. All of us. You can put your hand down. Anyone want to share why? Or if you, get, if you do remember? Fear of rejection. I, I think that's one of the most common reasons why we don't jerk into, like our knee-jerk reaction isn't to share. Our knee-jerk reaction is to shy away. Probably because of fear of rejection. Yeah, I think that's true. Yes, Grace. I think fear of getting fired. <laughs> fear of getting fired. I think that, that is legitimate. Because some people might say that we're imposing our beliefs and that it can be discriminating or it can be off-putting, even that you don't deserve to work at this place because of your belief. That's true. <coughs> Thanks for sharing. I think 
I have thought through both of them. Uh, I mean, in terms of getting fired, I thought more about with my clients that I meet. Um, there are moments when I share, when I ask my clients whether they're religious, but it's just to kind of probe them, but I don't really get to share the gospel, and that's predominantly because I don't want to get fired, and second, because that's not part of my job at, as a banker at Bank of America. So I don't try to gospelize someone with my work hours, per se, with my clients. Now, if they ask my faith, then I'm happy to share, but I, I don't typically preach the gospel to my clients. Now, raise your hand if the Lord has blessed you with the opportunity to share, but not only to share, but someone has come to saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ through you sharing at work. Any raise of hands? That is one of our prayer requests. Uh, one of our prayers, even from this class, is that we build a culture within our church in sharing the gospel, and not only sharing the gospel, but deepening our friendship with non-believers that they're not only sitting here, but they're sitting here on a weekly basis to hear God's word preached, to hear God's word preached even through you guys at work as you guys gospelize them, and that they would come to saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they, we would get to see more conversion. That's one of our prayer requests for this class. Now, thanks for sharing. Now, the reason why we do this is simple. If you guys have your worksheets... Page 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 19 through 20. Can I get a volunteer to read that for us? Tiffany, thank you. Thank you for sharing. The reason why we're reading that passage is because all of us have been given this ministry. And what is that ministry? Ministry of? Yes, ministry of reconciliation. So, brothers and sisters, the ministry of reconciliation doesn't just happen when, when non-believers and guests are coming into this door, into our church building. It actually happens also at 9 through five at your workplace. Maybe you don't work those hours, but even while you're at work, that ministry is still given to you. That ministry is given to you every day, 24 seven. So pastors are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And one of the ministries of the saints is ministry of reconciliation that you are given to um, preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified, resurrected for the sake of sinners who would repent and turn to trust in Christ. So remember that even at work, you are still in that ministry, ministry of reconciliation. Now, that doesn't mean that you drop everything that you're doing and you're only solely focused on the ministry of reconciliation. That would be a bad witness because you're getting paid to do your job. So you ought to, I ought to do our job exceptionally well because we're worshiping the Lord. We don't want to idolize work, but we also don't want to be idle at work. So worship the Lord at and through your work by being exceptional. That's how you also are being salt and light in the world that the Lord has placed us. But also not... Um, Searing your conscience or compromising your conscience, that's the second category. And third category is to gospelize our coworkers. That is, faithfully obeying the call to be ministers of the ministry of reconciliation. So the question is, how can we faithfully share the gospel at work? That's what we want to think about in class number 11 for the remainder of our time today. So let's start out by defining some terms. Define our terms. Now, if you have your handouts, we're in the second portion, but as we're in the second portion, you'll see the word evangelism. We're crossing that out and we're gonna use gospelize. Now, what does it mean to gospelize? You can take notes if you are. To gospelize, the term is to proclaim. 
and apply the gospel for the conversion of unbeliever and for the building up and grounding of believers firmly in the faith. You probably didn't get that, so I'll repeat it. To gospelize is to proclaim and apply. It's not only to proclaim, but also to apply the gospel. What's the purpose? Well, for the conversion of unbelievers. Now, when we think about evangelism, that's where we're pre predominantly thinking about, conversion of unbelievers. But we've switched the word from evangelism to gospelize for this purpose, because it's not only for unbelievers, but it's also for believers. So it's to proclaim and apply the gospel for the conversion of unbelievers and for the building up of believers firmly in the faith. So brothers and sisters, even when we share the gospel with our members, not for initial conversion, because initial conversion has happened by faith, but ongoing repentance and faith, we share the gospel. Because brothers and sisters, how many times do we forget about who God is, how he has saved us? How many times do we believe in lies and fall into temptations and sins? When we fall into temptations and sins and when we're discouraged and when we feel like we're paralyzed by our discouragements and sins and backsliding, how many times is it because of lies that we're believing about God and about ourselves according to the gospel? That's why we need brothers and sisters guarding each other. How do we guard each other? We guard each other by telling the truth about who God is and truth about who we are in light of the gospel. That's what gospelizing does. That we're not looking for initial conversion, but ongoing repentance and faith in Christ. And that's what we do. We gospelize each other. And that's also how we practice gospelizing unbelievers. Now, I'm kind of veering off from the topic. So defining our terms, gospelize, I kind of gave the term what gospelizing is, to proclaim and to apply gospel for unbelievers and for believers. Now, what gospelizing is not. First, gospelizing is not an imposition. Someone might ask, isn't it wrong to impose our beliefs on others? Um, I didn't get to change this as, all, as, as well because I read the manuscript after I printed this out. Why don't you cross out, if you have your um, pen, pen or pencil, cross out is not an imposition. I think it is. We're imposing. I think you can cross that out. And you can write on the side note, gospel is imposing, but the question is, don't everyone impose? And I think everyone does impose. How do we impose? Well, we, we impose what is right and wrong, and what is right and wrong comes from our beliefs. So when someone says, um, Tiffany, why are you sharing the gospel? Why are you shoving down what you believe onto my throat. Stop it. There are two things that should be happening right there. One, maybe you should think about how you're sharing the gospel. If they feel like, they're sh if, if they feel like you're shoving down what you believe down their throat, maybe you're not being winsome in your approach. That's the first question you want to look into yourself. Second is, well, what I'm imposing, aren't you also imposing as well? You're telling me, you're imposing your belief onto me, saying you ought not to share what you believe. Isn't that what you believe? Brothers and sisters, we all impose something in our lives. Whenever two image bearers are together, we're always trying to impress our image onto each other. It's inevitable. So isn't gospelizing an imposition? Absolutely. We always are imposing something. And we ought to impose what is true. And the gospel is true. So if someone were to ask you, Daniel, why are you imposing your belief onto me? You ought not to do that. You can say, well, we always impose something. You're, all, you're also imposing that onto me as well. So... We can't say that we, you ought not to, not, not to impose. We're always imposing something. And what I'm imposing, I believe, is true. So I want to impose what is truth onto you. That is the gospel. And let me share with you what the gospel is. And you can, uh, you can try to give a diagnosis of whether what I believe is true or not. 
I think that's a better approach rather than shying away when someone says it's not. You are not to impose. So cross that out. Gospelizing is an imposition. Now let's talk about three things that's, that it's not. Gospelizing is not personal testimony. Gospelizing is not a personal testimony. What's up, Nathaniel? <laughs> so, um, I think it's, so, it's often easier to share your personal testimony. I'm not saying it's the easiest thing, but it is easier than sharing the gospel. Anybody can take a stab at why per- sharing the personal testimony is easier than sharing the gospel? Yes, Grace. That's right. That's right. So, gospel requires a demand, or, yeah, gospel requires a response. It demands a response. So, the gospel call is, the gospel is not done when you haven't said, therefore, you ought to repent and turn to trust in Christ, because that's when it becomes a good news for you. Now, when you have turned your personal testimony into gospel, that's a different story. But I'm simply saying gospelizing is not and cannot equate to personal testimony and merely personal testimony. Ending the story with how the Lord has saved you and you alone. Because that doesn't give um, a requirement of how they ought to respond. Because it's merely your story. So don't think that you've shared the gospel by sharing your personal testimony, because it is not. So first, gospelizing is not personal testimony. Second, gospel, gospelizing is not social action and public involvement. Getting someone to vote for a constitutional amendment isn't evangelism. For example, I not only share the gospel with my coworkers, but I also talk about heated topics. I ask questions to my coworkers. Hey, my, um, this is a true story that happened. A client walked in. I don't know whether it's a she or he. The person looks like a she, but dressed like a man. So I didn't know what to call this person. I just escorted that person in. And because whenever a person and a client sits in front of me, I need to check their ID, I wanted to check the gender. When I took that ID, the gender was X, not F or not M, meaning X is non-binary in California. So with that, I took that to my coworkers during break and brought up a discussion point. That is, hey, this is what happened. What do you guys think? And we're talking now about gender dysphoria at work. I'm trying to tell and persuade them of what gender is and what gender isn't. Now, I think that's a good endeavor, but that's not sharing the gospel. I'm not doing that during my work hours. I'm also doing that during my break time because my work hour is what I'm getting paid to do to do my job well. But during my break hours, I'm not sharing the gospel with them by talking about abortion, talking about gender dysphoria, talking about the social issues. So we do need to understand, though it is a good endeavor and good conversation to have, that's not sharing the gospel. You may commend the gospel, but there's no saving power in talking about abortion or about gender dysphoria. Third, Evangelism or gospelizing is not apologetics. Um, Can anybody define the term apologetics here? What is apologetics? Anybody know? Tanner, do you know? Yes. So apologetic is defending the faith, but it's also defending what is true, what you believe to be true. You're not sharing the gospel by defending authenticity of Paul's letter. And I'm sure no one's doing this at work. No one is trying to defend the authenticity of Paul's letters. But you might 
try to prove the authenticity of Jesus' historicity and his resurrection. But you're not preaching the gospel by proving Jesus' resurrection or Jesus' um, death or historicity. Now, I'm not saying don't do that. But when you end with that, that's not sharing the gospel. One pastor said, quote, you can't checkmate someone into heaven, close quote, meaning you can't win in an argument and win them into heaven in that way. Now, someone might be able to be won by an argument and say, oh, that is true. But they also need to repent and turn to trust in Christ. And that simply doesn't happen by merely winning an argument. That happens by the Holy Spirit regenerating their hearts and them hearing the gospel. Because faith comes by hearing the word and the word of Christ. And we're preaching the word of Christ even as we share the gospel. So, a personal testimony, social action, and apologetics may all accompany gospelizing, but they are not gospelizing in and of itself. Any questions before we continue on answering what the gospel is? Any questions about what the gospel isn't? And I also talked about imposing. Any questions there or comments there? Yes, Tiffany? And what is First Amendment? Sorry. Thank you. I think that is true. So, if I can summarize what you're saying, gospel is an imposition that's also protected by the First Amendment, yet we ought to be careful in how we impose or how we share the gospel that it's not, that it ought to be winsome as well, depending on how they take it, because some people might have been coerced and shoved down their throat in the upbringing of their home. That's what you're saying, correct? Yeah. I think so as well. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, work to be undone as well in their lives. Because for me, I have a lot of testimony of sharing the gospel at work or talking about God at work. Because I want to make God heavy even at my work as I um, converse with my coworkers. So as I try to deepen my friendship with them, one of the first things that I do is asking about their upbringing and about their religious backgrounds. Majority of my coworkers actually come from a Roman Catholic background. And some of them, or majority of them, think that pastors fly on a jet. So when I told them that, that I'm a pastor working for my church, not as paid, but unpaid, they're like, wow, you have a jet? And I said, absolutely not. You can buy me one if you would like, but I don't have a jet. <laughs> So I had to do a lot of work to undo some of the things that they have learned from the past or from even, from even popular culture. The televangelists that they've even seen on television about them having a grand house, um, gospel, prosperity gospel preachers, false preachers. So I want to say that we want to, like what Tiffany said, kind of be mindful of where they're coming from and ask a lot of questions as well, even before we share the gospel. And it's not wrong to share the gospel before asking questions, but I think it's always good to ask questions. And that's one of the applications that I'll be talking about in the future in our class number 11. Thanks for your comment, Tiffany. We'll move on to what the gospel is. Now, if you're joining, if you have joined this church, you were asked this question um, in your interview. What is the gospel? Share it with me in less than 60 seconds. Now, gospel, we can explain in 60 seconds. We can explain in 30 seconds. We can also explain in, in a year. 
there's a lot of work to be done in sharing the gospel. But if we can summarize what the gospel is, it's four bullet points. God, man, Christ, response. That God made us, that he made us to show off how good he is. But man rebelled. That we're born sinners now. That we're not born um, as saints and good and neutral. We're actually bent towards sin. That we, now we're living to show, show off our own selves. And the Bible calls this sin. And when we sin, God is separated from us. Or we're separated from God because God is holy and we're not. And we deserve rightful punishment for our sin. That's why God sends his only son, Christ. He lives a perfect life. He dies a sinner's death on the cross. He becomes a curse for those who would repent and turn to trust in Christ. And the demand is the only way this becomes a good news for you is when you repent and turn to trust, trust and treasure Christ. That's the gospel. God, man, Christ responds. Friends, if you're not a believer here, if you're not a Christian here, that's what the gospel is. That though you and I claim ourselves to be good and not worse or not bad enough to deserve hell, we actually all deserve hell. That we all actually deserve rightful condemnation from the Lord. Yet the good news is that Christ died for us, for us who would repent and turn to trust in Christ. And you can turn to trust in Christ today and repent and treasure Christ and be reconciled to the Father, to God. That's the good news. So friends, if you're not a Christian here, I plead with you to repent and turn to trust in Christ. Thank you. Bam. That's real hot. Now that's what the gospel is. is. If we aren't sharing the gospel, we aren't gospelizing. Now turn to the second page, second page of your handout. If you don't have a handout, there should be a handout in the back. Gospelizing barriers, gospelizing barriers. What are some more common reasons we don't share the gospel in our workplaces? Let me reel off a few. First, fear of man. We don't want to be thought less by our colleagues. Maybe you're thinking, I might lose my reputation at work. We want to fit in, and we want them to like us. Um, everyone at my work knows that I'm a pastor, except for new hire that we have, who just got hired maybe two weeks ago or a week ago. Now, because they know that I'm a pastor and I'm a Christian, every time they swear, they kind of back off and they say, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and that has become almost like a mockery or disdainful mockery. And I tell them, it's okay, man. I, I don't really care whether you swear or not. I care that you believe in Christ or not. Um, and even some of the jokes that they uh, say, they would say, oh, Peter shouldn't hear this. Cover your ears. When you share the gospel with, with people and they know that you're a Christian, at least two things happen. One, they look at you differently. Second, they look at you more closely because they want to see how you behave as a Christian. And let me confess one of my sins that I've asked the Lord for forgiveness as well. Using my cell phone at work, I fight to not to use my cell phone in my workstation. But sometimes I do. And one of my coworkers called me out on that as a joke. Said, ah, Peter, you use your phone all the time at work. And that caught my antennas. Oh, man. They are looking at me. And I don't want to simply change my behaviors because they're looking at me. But I do need to be mindful that they are looking at me. Now, does that mean that I ought not to do certain X, Y, Zs because they're looking at me? Absolutely not. I ought to be who I am. And if I'm sinning against the Lord, I ought to repent. And I should also ask them for forgiveness as well if I've sinned against them. Um, I've been in a conversation with my boss of multiple occasions of me asking for forgiveness from him because I've sinned against him. 
He knows that I'm a Christian. He knows that I'm a pastor. But he also knows that I'm not perfect. And it's good for him to know that I'm not perfect. Because Christians are not those who are perfect. Christians are those who are forgiven because Christ is perfect. And I want my coworkers to know that. Now, I'm not deliberately sinning against them and sinning against the Lord so that they can see that. But they're going to see that no matter what because I'm a sinner. And brothers and sisters, your coworkers are going to see that as well. And that's okay. Let them know that you're not perfect. And that also fits nicely into fear of man. Because, brothers and sisters, we ought not to fear man because they only have the power to maybe fire you or even kill your body, but not to put your soul into a lake of fire and your body. But the Lord does. And the Lord will if they don't repent and turn to trust in Christ. But a lot of us, the first knee-jerk reaction when we face um, non-Christian isn't strategizing how to share the gospel, but it is just shying away. Brothers, don't shy away. Tell them the truth. Sisters, don't shy away. Tell them what you believe. Because what you believe is true. And the judgment day is coming. And they might say, why didn't you share the gospel with me? The Lord has placed you strategically where you are. At your workplaces, share the gospel. Bite the bullet. It's okay that they reject you. And maybe you should even expect rejection. Because who was rejected before we were? Christ was. So we can be rejected, and that's imitating Christ, as we're rejected in the name of Christ. Now, fear of man might be most sympathetic sounding one that one of the reasons that we have. But there are some that are not more most sympathetic. And here are some. Time and attention. Maybe you're not sharing the gospel at work because you're so wrapped up at work. Maybe you don't even actually think about the gospel at work. And that might be some of us here. The gospel is segregated, segregated from work, detached from work. You have categorized work as work, Christian in another sense. You have a lot of time from nine to five for your work, but not for the gospel. Brothers and sisters, our identity is sons and daughters of Christ wherever we go. The ministry of reconciliation that we've been given is wherever we go 24-7. You don't have to raise your hand. This is a rhetorical question. How many of us have time with our friends or with our coworkers at work, but we don't share the gospel even when we have time? I think all of us. So it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of priority in our minds. And like I shared, um, I shared this a couple weeks back. If there's a spectrum between idolizing work, being idle at work, I think a lot of our church members are more of a, on, on the idle side rather than the idolizing side. And that's because we, we love our church gathering. We always ask, how's your soul doing? When did you come to faith in Christ? If you see a guest. We're always right into deeper conversations. And we love that. I also love that. That's one of the things I love about our church. We want to get into the deep trenches of, our, of the conditions of our souls, of each other's souls. We want to guard each other faithfully. And that's one of the reasons, perhaps, why we're idle at work, because we feel like that's not good enough for us. We simply do that to earn living so that we can do deeper end stuff work here. But that's not true. The Lord has placed you here on Sundays, but majority of times we're scattered church. So use your time wisely. Second, uncertainty, or third, uncertainty about propriety. As Christians, we've got some of the same concerns about workplace evangelism as your HR department. Thanks, guys. We don't want to be guilty of harassment or of creating a hostile work environment. And yet, one of the most loving things that we can do is to tell them the truth, is to tell our coworkers of what the gospel is, figuring out how to do that in a way that's appropriate 
and sometimes be paralyzing. Fourth, we are ill-prepared. We actually don't feel all equipped to share the gospel. And some of us might feel that way. Let me give you a practical tip to how to do that, how to better equip yourself. Share the gospel with members of this church. How do you do that? You can first, you can say, hey, I want to grow in sharing the gospel. Can I share the gospel? And you can kind of push back. <coughs> you can practice that way. Second, I think a better way to do that, not the only way, but a better way is to, when someone is sharing your, their struggle, think about how to share the gospel there. Because when they're sharing their struggle and their fights and their temptation, there is oftentimes a lie that they're believing about God and about themselves. And you can fit the gospel right there and then. So make God heavy in your conversations with members and carry that out at work. What is one question that your coworkers ask when you come back from a weekend? They say, they ask you, what you do on your weekend? Or how was your weekend? And your typical answer was, pretty good. Or I went to church. Brothers and sisters, how many times have you shared the takeaway with other members? Hundreds of times, if you've been here for years. But you're almost trained to share your takeaway. You have a takeaway. Have you considered sharing your takeaway with your non-believing friends and coworkers at work? When they ask you, I mean, they're practically giving you a, a way in. How was your weekend? You can say, oh, I learned something this past weekend. They would ask you, oh, what did you learn? Well, I learned that God is immutable, that God is unchanging. And that was such a comforting truth because everyone changes, but God doesn't change. And he's good and he's powerful. That's my comfort. Just one, one sentence takeaway. And they're going to think, okay, that's weird. But who cares if it's weird? <laughs> you want to make God in the conversation. That's how you practice. So do you feel ill-equipped? Maybe. But you can take small steps to share the gospel and push constantly. Small pushes. Put a pebble in their shoe. Throw a pebble each, each Monday. And ask other members to join you and be prayerful for them. What is a fifth reason? Uh, no non-Christian friends at work. You might be just zoned in at work, but you don't make any friends at work. Friends, brothers and sisters, that is probably not the best way to go. Deepen friendship at work. Get to know them. Get to know their story. Now, some of you might be working remotely, and that might be a little tougher because you guys are chatting or going on a phone call, and you're not going to be... I mean, typically, phone calls are just down to business. But you could ask them how their weekend was, and they might ask you how your weekend was, and right back at you, and you can share your takeaway. Or, um, I mean, I don't really know because I don't work remotely, but I'm sure if your priority is that of, I want to deepen my friendship even as I work remotely, the how you will figure out. But if the what isn't there and why isn't there, then how won't figure itself out. Don't simply make an excuse of, I work remotely so I can't share the gospel, but try to think about, I want to share the gospel, but I work remotely, now how? Because when you think about that, you will try to strategize how. And there's, I think there are hundreds and thousands of ways that you can share the gospel, even as you work remotely. Sixth and last reason is gospelizing barriers is because it's discouraging. Maybe if you're like me, you've shared the gospel. Maybe you've shared the gospel with one person and asked that person to read the Bible over and over again. And the overarching answer from that person is a resounding no. I don't do that. And maybe that has changed your relationship with that person. But take heart. Keep going at it. 
These are some of the reasons why generally we don't gospelize. I bet you could add a few more. The question is, so what do we do about this? What do we do about all these barriers that we feel? Now let's get practical now about how we can grow in our gospelizing at our workplace. Now I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, there's no magical formula here. Just a starter list of effective practices that I've seen that can help us grow in our gospelizing. And I'll split them into things you do privately and things you do publicly. So how do we grow in gospelizing? Things that you can do privately and things that you can do publicly. Now we are in the third page of our handout. (coughs) What can you do privately? Four. Pray, know the gospel, adopt the right metrics, and fourth, cultivate humility. Humility. First reason might be, ah, of course, pray. When was the last time you prayed for your coworker? If you're trying to share the gospel with them and you are actively at work, when is the last time you prayed for that coworker? Where does faith come from? Does it ultimately come from my persuasion skills? skills? Obviously, I don't have skills enough. <laughs> Does, can you persuade someone out of he- hell into heaven? No. Faith comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from the Lord. It belongs to the Lord, not ultimately to me. The Lord has given us opportunity to share the gospel, and the Lord has given us friendships. Yet, the author of salvation is not me, is not you, it's the Lord. So why should we pray? We pray because salvation comes from the Lord. Ask the Lord to not only to give you the opportunity, to, but to regenerate that person's heart. Because it's the Lord's work. And that is also freeing of a burden that you might feel. A burden that you might feel is, I don't want to mess up the gospel. I don't want to mess up, and that's the only time this person hears the gospel, and they're going to end up in hell. That is such a big burden. Well, you don't have to feel that burden, brothers and sisters, because that is not a burden that you ought to carry. That burden belongs to the Lord because it's His work. I mean, even think about how you came to faith. How many times did it take you to believe in Christ? How many people have shared the gospel with you? But there was a moment when a light bulb went out. And you're thinking, ah, that makes sense. And it kind of clicks together. You don't have to bear that burden. So, first things first is to pray. And brothers and sisters, I would commend you not to pray by yourself. And you can pray by yourself, but a better way is to pray with other members. Are you in a city group? If you are in a city group, that happens every other Wednesday, um, join them and pray with them of the coworkers and neighbors that you're trying to gospelize. Maybe you're not in a city group. Then ask your accountability brothers and sisters or even just members at church. If they say, hey, how is your week? Oh, I've been trying to gospelize this coworker. Can you pray for this person? Maybe come to evening gathering and say, hey, I have been trying to gospelize my coworker, Danielle. Can you pray for this person to come to faith? Pray with other brothers and sisters. You can do that. Second thing that you can do privately, know the gospel. I think memorizing the gospel and practicing is really important because you want to have your mind clear when the opportunity rises. Practice makes perfect. Now, obviously, we can't be perfect in sharing the gospel because even when things are perfect, um, faith doesn't come from us. But practice does uh, make things better for us, makes us better communicators. So do practice in sharing the gospel. And I've shared that, how you can do that with other members of this church. Third thing that you can do privately, measure your efforts by your faithfulness to clearly presenting the gospel. Don't measure it by the response that you get. 
And that flows um, inevitably, inevitably from and naturally from the fact that salvation comes from the Lord and not from us. So we can't measure our success and our um, effectiveness by the response. Brothers and sisters, I've been sharing the gospel with my coworkers Luis and Marcos for Marcos for three years, Luis with about a year. I've shared the gospel multiple times. I've asked them to read the Bible with me multiple times. And the resounding answer was a no, multiple times. But I'm not discouraged. I'm just going to keep going. Because one day, things might click for them. And the Lord might work in their hearts. And he is working in their hearts, but he might regenerate their hearts and they might come to saving knowledge of Christ. And it doesn't have to be through me. I just want to be faithful. I don't need to think about the response. The response is the Lord's, not mine. I'm going to do what I'm called to do. Our job is to faithfully present the gospel, not to get their response. God chooses to do the work. So privately, adopt the right metrics. Fourth, something that you can do privately is to cultivate humility. Understand that you're likely to be thought less of in the workplace if you put Christ on the table and actually share the gospel. They might laugh at you, but be prepared to be laughed at. They might say, you actually believe in that? The response will be, the, oh, sorry. Temptation will be to guard your reputation more aggressively. No one wants to be thought of as a dimwit, but that may be exactly the consequence of aligning yourself publicly with Christ. There's a cost of following Christ, and we have counted that cost, and the cost might be being made fun of at work. So cultivate humility by saying, that's okay. I've counted that cost, and the gain is much higher, infinitely higher than what I'm paying. So those are the four things that you can do privately. Lastly, what can you do publicly? First, I've talked about these. First, put Christ on the table. Ask good questions. Ask good questions. Make God heavy in your conversations and ask a lot of questions. And you can even write down some of the questions that you want to ask to your coworkers. One of the questions might be, do you have any religious background? Do you have any siblings? How are your relationship with your siblings? You just want to get to know them on a personal level. And they might ask you, stop asking me these personal questions. You can stop and say, okay, that's fine. And next time you come and... and um, talk with that person, you can tell them your story. Because as coworkers, they also want to get to know you, and you also want to get to know them on a friendship level. And then eventually, you're going to be asking some more personal questions. You can wait for that to happen. If they're saying back off, you can back off. But the first way to do that, first way to put Christ on the table is to ask good questions. Good questions are disallowed disarming. You don't want to come out with a statement of who Christ is. I mean, you can, but I think more winsome way is to ask questions first. Hey, what do you think of this? Or this is something that I used to do. I used to take, I, I still do this. I take books to work and I leave it at a public place to let them know that I'm reading and what I'm reading. And during um, break hours, I sometimes am reading, sometimes spe speed reading, and they're asking, hey, what are, you, what are you reading? Natural conversation of what I'm, I'm not reading like self-help books. I'm just reading theological books or books that I'm interested in. The latest book that I've been reading is According to Plan by Graham, Gold, uh, Graham Goldsworthy. And they're asking, hey, what are you reading? I tell them what I'm reading. Um, I also read Good and Angry. Uh, by David Pallison, and they're asking, what are you reading? I have trouble with anger with my kids, so I'm reading this, and the Lord has told me to do this, this, and that. So it's a natural way to converse about what I believe by telling them to ask me questions. They're going to be asking me questions if they see something interesting. So you can be doing that as well. 
Second thing that you can do, or uh, in the first, put Christ on table, get to know your boss and direct reports. Now, you might be shying away from getting to know your boss, but <coughs> I think one of the one of the people that you talk to most at your work is your boss because you have direct reports. You need to give reports, which means God gives you more opportunities to share the gospel and get to know that person. So don't shy away from asking questions to your boss. Actually, my closest relationship at work have been my bosses. Luis is a manager. Marcos is also a manager. So get to know your bosses. And also, don't just seek to um, share the gospel. Ask good questions to get to know them and deepen your friendship with them. Go out and have a meal with them. I've shared a meal and a drink with my boss, uh, Marcos. And he still asks me, hey, like, do you want to go out for a drink? I say, absolutely. I want to go out for a drink and get to know you better. So get to know them, get to know your boss, and also get to know them outside of work and pr- put Christ on the table um, with the opportunities that the Lord has, that the Lord gives you. Second thing that you can do publicly is to be excellent at what you do. And I've talked about this. When you put Christ on the table, you need to understand that people are watching you. They're going to watch you closely. So make sure that your work reflects creativity, purpose, goodness of God, and great king. Brothers and sisters, don't use work hours to be on your cell phones. I'm also talking to myself. to share the gospel and the boss is saying, what is he? I mean, you can share the gospel during break or lunch. Do your job during your work hours. And I would resound the same thing. Do your work during your work hours and be excellent workers because you're you're worshiping the Lord and the King as you're working because your work is worship. So be excellent at what you do. Third, Build relationships lovingly. Brothers and sisters, don't look at your coworkers as projects. Put yourself in their shoes. How would you feel if if someone view you, if someone views you as a project? You would say, no, 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 I don't want that. I'm not a project, I'm a person. What we want is not for us to be worked on, but we want to build friendship and relationship. So, invest in non-Christians in your workplace, not as projects, but lovingly as made in God's image. Not, as, not superficially, but by sharing your life with them. Share your life with them. Ask questions, but also give them answers as well. Fourth, be wise and winsome, not worried or wimpy. Now, many of you here might be thinking, I'm motivated and I want to build the kingdom through gospelizing, but I also want to build my career and provide my family. And sometimes it feels like those two interests are pitted against each other. Now, how do I navigate that? Well, let's be honest, it's difficult. You're, you're new in your office and a controversial topic comes up and you know that a biblical position on it will likely be at odds with what everyone else thinks. How should you respond? You have a good relationship with your boss, and you're, you're not exactly how sure it might affect your job status if he knew you thought if he knew you thought he was going to hell. What's the best way to approach the gospel? What if he asks you directly? And my boss has done that. He's a Roman Catholic. We have a good relationship. He asked me point blank, Peter, are you saying that I'm going to end up in hell? And I told him, Luis, I love you, but yes, that's what I'm telling you. And I'm not telling you because I hate you. I'm not telling you because I I abhor you. I, I think less of you. I think that because you're not a Christian. That's the truth. And I love you. And that's why I'm telling you that. So if someone asks you, 
point blank, you might need to kind of weigh your friendship and don't shy away from answering that. Answer that straight, answer that truthfully, but ask also answer that winsomely. They might even ask you, what do you think about homosexuality? How would you answer that at work? Or answer them truthfully. I also had to answer that question to my coworkers. I say, yeah, I think homosexuality is wrong, just as I think sex before marriage is wrong. Do I love that person? I absolutely love that person. But I'm going to impose what I think is true. And I think this is true. What they believe is false and wrong. So be winsome. Don't just answer that question and end with that statement. Tell them you love them and be winsome in your approach. Don't be worried. Keep on with the conversation. The conversation doesn't end there. The conversation is actually ongoing. You might end your break in 10 minutes or your lunch in an hour, but you're still working with them the next week and the following week. Your friendship is ongoing and your conversation is ongoing. Remember that. Fifth is to have a mission field mindset at work. Have you ever considered doing your work exactly what you're doing right now overseas? I'm a banker. Maybe being a banker in uh, Central Asia or in Japan or different countries. But also another question is, do you think the Lord has placed some of the people from the nations at your workplace? What group of people has the king deployed you to? It might not be just nations. It might be people who have different type of jobs, architects, teachers, auto sales people. Thinking about it that way helps us not to get discouraged by the thought of millions of people who need to hear the gospel. <coughs> Instead, we're focused on a specific network of friends and relationships where we can speak truth that's rarely heard. So those are some of the things that we can do publicly. Now, let me conclude. Let me conclude with Paul's encouraging words from 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance of from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? Because we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God. In the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we know that we lack in wisdom. We know that we lack in even in zeal and strategy in gospelizing our coworkers. Yet let's pray that the Lord would help us to be an aroma of Christ at our workplace. I'll take a minute to see if you have any questions or comments about we've, we've covered gospelizing barriers, habits of workplace as a gospelizer, privately and publicly. Any questions or comments? Yes, Grace? I feel like I need to repent. <coughs> Excuse me? I feel like I need to repent. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, but I think I thought about it, and I love all the suggestions you gave. So many creative ways to gospelize brethren, my coworkers. And I think it's really Yeah, yeah. I think um, how we'll figure itself out when we, when we are solid on what and why. Yeah, that's good. Uh, okay, before I finish, book commendations. On the Gospel at Work, chapter 9, it gives you answer. The question is, how can I share the Gospel at work? If you're feeling like, oh man, I don't know how to share the gospel at work, chapter 9 of this book will be very helpful to you. Anybody want this book for the sake of reading chapter 9? If you can't read the entire book, you can just read chapter 9. Anybody?
Yes, Trisha. Give this to you. Thank you. I will close us with the word of prayer. <laughs> Father, we thank you that we got to think about um, gospelizing at workplace. Uh, we know that we fall short in gospelizing our coworkers, our neighbors. We're just not really thinking through that at work. Help us, we pray, to be strategic and to know that you have, um, in your providence, placed us where we are to share the gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, we, have, we don't have any minutes, so use the rest of them if you can. We'll start shortly. Thanks, guys. If you're new here, there's restrooms behind these two doors on your right. First and second floor. Feel free to use it anytime, guys.